Hello, this is Galen Moore from Coindesk Research, and what you're about to listen to is a recording of a webinar we produced on October 28 with two veteran OTC traders. OTC stands for over-the-counter, and it's the way, depending on whose estimate you believe, anywhere from 30 to 65% of crypto assets move through these markets. For all the talk of liquidity, Bitcoin and other crypto assets remain thin markets. Investors who want to make large trades need to do so without moving the price, and OTC desks help them do that. I talked with Yin Fang Xiao, formerly of Circle Trading, which moved $24 billion in 2018. Yin is now working on developing a new OTC business, Reciprocity Trading. I also talked with Martin Garcia of Genesis Trading. They move millions daily, and Martin has been involved in crypto assets since very early days. As a disclosure, Genesis and Coindesk are both owned by Digital Currency Group. I hope you'll enjoy the conversation. OTC desks take on tremendous temporary risk in volatile crypto markets, and traders like Martin and Yin are responsible for managing it, moving large amounts without slippage, and hedging risk in derivatives markets until they can do so. We talked about how derivatives move spot prices and vice versa, where to find liquidity, and whether US regulated exchanges can ever compete with their offshore counterparts. And we took a lot of good questions from a large crowd listening in. If you listen and you like what you're hearing, please sign up for our newsletter, Institutional Crypto. You can find it at coindesk.com slash newsletters or email us, research at coindesk.com. And please look out for more of these conversations soon. Do you think the mentality has changed? I mean, you mentioned the sort of venture capital early days, you know, kind of wanting to buy and hold type of investor. How do people coming in today view the market and what, what, is, what are they sort of you know, are they are they trading in and out more often? What's the kind of? Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot more, um, you know, velocity amongst the traders that are out there. Whereas in the early days, it was definitely more of a a buy and hold by and large. Uh -huh. um, you know, now people understand that they this market is super volatile, uh -huh. and a lot of the different crypto funds and people that are out there, they are trying to add you know alpha for their for their you know shareholders. And so they are, you know, moving much quicker, um, you know, just overall. Do you think that then for some of these clients, like this is the way they trade, this is the way they go in and out of positions in crypto? Yeah, I think that it is something that you would expect, um, you know, much more, you know, technology, just given our space to, to have entered. I think that we're seeing it now in a big, big way. Um, but as I was kind of mentioning when we had the, the difficulties, you know, there is still, you know, to my knowledge, no more efficient of a way to execute a trade with the the, the least amount of counterparty risk uh, than with an OTC desk that you have onboarded in trust. Uh, you know, many times we're quoting a spread that is tighter than what a commission might be through through some of the different brokerages that are out there um, trading. So, you know, some people have sophisticated strategies where they need that they need to, you know, kind of that agency model. Um, but by and large, right now, just where the market is currently, um, the the OTC desks that are out there, they they serve a, you know, a worthwhile purpose, um, you know, now and really allow kind of efficient trading in and out. So what kind of volumes are we talking about here? I, you know, I don't know how much, Martin, you can say, but how much do you on a typical day handle through the desk at Genesis? Yeah, so on our um, it's not uh, billions per month, at least not, you know, not in 2019, but there are definitely months where we are well surpassing that. It really just depends on what's going on in the market um, and really, really, but it's, it's, it's fairly robust, but keep in mind, you know, we're also, uh, you know, more tightly regulated. You know, we unfortunately have to turn down a, a fair amount of the robustness of our KYC. And, you know, because we are taking, you know, that that risk with the counterparty when they execute, we are, you know, our counterparties fund first. Yeah. But we are uh, at risk of, of the market. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, with, you know, with the, you know, proliferation of, of Silvergate's uh, exchange network, which is a 24-7, you know, uh, banking process where you can transfer to a known counterparty. Uh, bank uh, is another one that has a uh, uh, called Signet, 
which is their 24-7 settlement mechanism, it's really allowed uh, these OTC desks like us to, to mitigate risk because we can settle transactions so very quickly. During the time when you have just uh, bought uh, and you are you know, sort of looking to sell or trying to move some funds into the market, let's say you've agreed to sell for a client, you take on the amount of that trade. Yin, can you talk a little, a little bit about how you, you're sitting there uh, long, uh, sort of inadvertently, not due to some strategy, mm -hmm. but due to the sort of ad hoc nature of the business? Uh, what, what are the kinds of things you do in that time period to, to mitigate the risk of the position you've inadvertently taken on? Yeah. Um, so really, if it's for Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, chances are you can offload that risk, not via the spot markets on exchanges, but via um, you know, swaps or other types of derivatives. Um, and you know, for the most part, that's an incredibly efficient process you're talking about. You can you know, offset millions of dollars worth of risk nearly instantaneously with very little slippage. Um, I think like where uh, things tend to, let's say, break down a little bit or you incur a lot more slippage uh, is when you simply exhausted everybody's ability to really use the derivatives instruments to hedge. Um, so whether that's uh, the amount of collateral that everybody's kind of collectively posted is insufficient um, or it's just that the market conditions are such that, you know, you really can't get access to uh, some of these platforms. Um, but that, that's when it tends to break down. Huh. So um, let's talk about that a little bit. I think the derivatives markets have gotten pretty interesting uh, over the past week. I mean, if you think about the price moves that um, Bitcoin at least has seen uh, in this last week here, just in the last week, a lot, you know, sort of getting to a, volatility was pretty low for a while. And then you saw the sudden move down, sudden move up. Uh, what, what happens in the derivatives markets in a week like that? What, what, what um, I mean, you see a lot of volume go up on, the, on futures and swaps. Um, you know, how, how can you kind of explain that from the point of view of somebody who's holding a derivatives position at the moment when the market jumps like that? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, maybe the best way to think about it is that, all right, so crypto already is like a fairly volatile random walk in terms of price action. Um, and then the collection of these uh, various derivatives and exchanges that list them um, effectively act as like leverage on top of that. So whenever you start getting a move, chances are there, there's a good chance that it'll get exacerbated uh, because the amount of open bets, if you will, uh, that are out there via these derivatives instruments. Can you give me some kind of examples, Martin, of like where where does this come in? Like what kind of strategies are you employing um, in derivatives markets? What kind of positions are you taking in order to you know, mitigate risk? And Yeah, uh, so it's, you know, as you said, you're, you're using the futures and derivatives um, to kind of complement the liquidity that you can can obtain um, you know, in the spot markets. Mm. For us, because we are, you know, more heavily regulated, we have less access to a lot of these uh, derivatives exchanges because they are, in many cases, not based in the U.S. And while they have tons of great liquidity, um, and it's something that we work very hard to, to get access to, um, you know, there is still counterparty risk there. So you guys are using exclusively U.S. regulated uh, derivatives exchanges? So on our side, you know, on the spot trading side, we we use very little of the you know of the derivatives exchanges to to really uh, to really hedge currently. Uh -huh. It's become more of what we do. Uh -huh. um, but right now, just because there are you know so few that are you know you, you know regulated in the U.S., uh -huh. it's just been tougher for us to get on there. But what what is interesting is that we on our side, you know, we are able to access. You know the the spot markets. We have a number of different uh, counterparties that that we work with, where we can move pretty quickly, and we do utilize um, you know effectively. You know, as as it's more volatile, the spreads are going to tend to widen out. But what you're also going to see is on derivatives exchanges, as Jim was mentioning, the cascade effect mm -hmm. can really have a tremendous impact, and that's where you see some of these moves where. You know, it may not have otherwise been such a large move up or down, but it hits, you know, stop loss or stop limit orders that then get filled and 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 the market kind of runs away until yeah. uh, until the markets can kind of regain control. Yeah. So I want to I want to talk about that in a minute uh, in terms of how derivatives move the spot market and vice versa. But I, I also want to talk about the uh, sort of offshore. Uh, I guess it depends on where you are, whether it's offshore or not. But the lightly regulated Asian exchanges, uh, BitMEX. Uh, will be OKX. Uh, I know that there are OTC desks that make 
pretty significant use of those markets in order to hedge risk. You know, as you're setting up for reciprocity, what, mm -hmm. what's your expectation? Will you be using those markets or are you going to stay out of them? Yeah, so we're, we are going to set up uh, an international entity to be able to access some of those markets. So um, what, is, what does that enable you to do? If you've got somebody in Singapore or Toronto or whatever, mm -hmm. what does that enable you to do that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do if you were just using, say, CME and BACT, for example? Yeah, um, I, I think, oh, certainly, uh, you know, a large uh, hurdle to using a CME or a BACT is simply the capital requirement. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's a different set of pipes. You need to get an FCM, right? You need to connect, be able to actually connect that CME in the first place, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if nothing else. And you then, can just go on BitMEX like tonight. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, that, that, that certainly helps. Um, but also in terms, but also in terms of like what is your collateral actually being posted in, right? So yeah. cash is like dollars are still fairly expensive in our space, whereas right. whereas getting balance sheet in crypto is relatively cheap. You post your maintenance margin in Bitcoin rather than in dollars. Exactly. Yeah, and that's cheaper and it's probably faster. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's faster. And it's, there's so much liquidity there as well. Uh, right. So I mean, it it, it definitely. You know the CME futures have definitely picked up, you know, tremendous volume. Right. Uh, you know, hopefully backed will will follow suit and just be more, you know, more liquidity. Uh, but you know, on these, you know, on these Asian derivatives exchanges, there is real, you know, real liquidity there, um, and it is very advantageous to be up on those. I mean, it's the same thing that that we go through in setting up international entities on on our side as well. Just because you, if you are going to be competitive, you need to be accessing you know, all the different various venues for liquidity um, that are that are open to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, does that does that set you back sort of limiting where you'll where you'll trade? As you were saying, you tend to rely more on being able to move quickly in the spot market, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it I mean, does. Are there, are there trades you can't do or sort of clients you can't take on as a result of that? And beyond the KYC issue, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, no, we're very fortunate to uh, to be one of the incumbents in the space to, to be very well capitalized. So we, we find that we're able to access the liquidity that we need. Um, you know, obviously, I always want to be able to move quicker because, like mm -hmm. you said, it becomes a risk question. But at this point, you know, it's the risk of the exchange also exists as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have the risk of the market moving, which we, you know, generally are very comfortable with. You know, we, we understand this is a very volatile asset. Um, you know, we, we, you know, are in this market every day. So, so there we are pretty well comfortable. Mm -hmm. the things that you can't control are obviously your your counterparty risk. And that's something that we take really seriously. Um, and, you know, we will be doing more, um, you know, there hopefully as these uh, exchanges have gotten better and better. Yeah. Um, but it definitely has taken us time to get comfortable. I want to actually ask a question kind of related to that that came in from a, uh, uh, from a listener on the webinar here. Uh, and we will take a few more questions toward the end. Um, as well. Uh, so by all means, if you're logged in right now, please, if you have a question that's coming up as we're talking, please enter it and we'll see those and uh, try to get to them if we can. Uh, the, the question that came in before the uh, before we started here is, you know, what's the sort of typical ratio of reserve assets to per day OTC volume? Do you guys have a kind of ratio that you look to on that? that so on, on our side, you know, we, we run a trade through a broker dealer. We have net capital uh, that we have to maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, so what that means is that, you know, Bitcoin and all the digital assets uh, they get zero capital treatment on our balance sheets. Mm -hmm. So it means to do, you know, the large trades that we do, we have to be very well capitalized mm -hmm. on, on our side. And we can't, you know, sell something for which we don't have, you know, effectively fiat reserve for. So if you came into our desk and you wanted to do, you know, buy $100 million worth of Bitcoin, you know, I'm likely going to have to break that up into pieces so that I can do it from a net capital perspective. Mm -hmm. That's a unique thing to us because we are a broker dealer that have to maintain net capital that, you know, other desks that are not uh, may not have to deal with those issues um, because they can take the market risk of going, right. you know, net long or net short um, in that, in, in depending on which way the market's going. Yeah, and Martin was talking a minute ago about um, uh, counterparty risk on the exchanges. And I, you know, I've, I've looked, I've watched the sort of growing balance sheet of the insurance fund at BitMEX mm -hmm. and sort of wonder like, you know, and I know there are some people like CoinFlex, for example, who are coming to market with, you know, specifically saying, look, these, uh, you know, that some of the larger exchanges and derivatives are, are kind of uh, have a conflict of interest, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, against their users. So I wonder how you view that uh, as someone who's more likely to use those offshore markets. Uh, are you sort of does it keep you up at night uh, that there's some kind of counterparty risk there that you might be trading against the exchange? Uh, so it's, I guess, in terms of the actual risk, it's, it's 
entirely qualitative and pretty much binary in terms of you're either comfortable with a given exchange or you're not. And mm -hmm. usually that breaks down into like, do we actually have a direct line into them, right? In mm -hmm. case something goes wrong, mm -hmm. right? Like what recourse do we really have? Right. Um, there's, it, it's very difficult to measure in terms of sort of like the counterparty risk or like CBA or something like that. Right. Um, it's, it's really just not possible. And so, yeah. you know, it comes down to questions like, can I get a hold of, you know, the head of, you so know, you have a BitMEX, BitMEX agent. Exactly. Uh -huh. How often do they take you out to dinner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, more often, I wish. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think there's a kind of a, a I guess, a, a stratification of different kinds of users on them. I mean, there's a, what, I mean, do you guys ever think about like what percentage of the users on one of the large offshore derivatives exchanges are retail? And what percentage are institutional? I mean, is there, do you have, I mean, any eyeball on that at all? There's no real clarity that I've seen. I'd be curious to see what Ian says, but yeah. we don't have any handle on, on that other than what we read. Um, yeah. You know, so, so I'm yeah. pretty sure nobody at BitMEX is going to take me out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, not that I would be trading on BitMEX anyway, because you're not allowed to as a U.S. Uh, resident, right? Uh, so, so question then about... Um, you know, this kind of uh, interplay between the spot market and the derivatives markets, right? Like, uh, and we, you know, I think fairly obviously there's this kind of momentum thing that happens. Uh, but does it go, does it go the other way too? Does the, do the derivatives markets start that momentum cascade at times? Do you see derivatives act, uh, activity moving the spot market? Yeah, absolutely. Is that a thing? It, it, it absolutely is a thing. Can you talk about that a little bit. Like, how does that work? Yeah, um, I mean, it's really, um, I think like a very interesting thing about our space is because there are so many trading venues, right? It's a constant question of who's, where is the action starting, right? And so mm -hmm. often it is starting on derivative exchanges just because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people have connections to and that's where a lot of the most highly levered bets are being placed. Um, and so it certainly takes more to kind of break that, if you will, right? And kind of cause that cascade effect to start. Um, when you're talking about, okay, well, maybe on a spot exchange, it takes on the scale of 10 to $50 million worth of volume in right. one go to really cause a uh, you know, real market move. Yeah. Um, you might be talking well, we, about like an order magnitude. We talked about that in May, of, the May 17 event, right? Yeah. So there, we, I mean, ran some analysis on that with some uh, tick level data. It looked like it cost them about $2 million, right, to, uh, to actually move the market on Bitstamp, which then kind of kicked things I, off on Bitfinet. I think on, it was higher, but it was basically like there was an implicit, I think it was something like in the range of like $25 million on Bitstamp huh. caused a, a set, caused like somewhere between half a billion to a billion dollars worth of uh, yeah. derivatives contracts to move as a result. So this was, a, what we're talking about here was an event on May 17. It was, a, I think mean, it's known widely as the flash crash, right? Bitcoin flash crash. I think people use that term. Uh, and uh, basically, BitMEX uh, has uh, an index made up of three exchanges. The constituent, the constituent spot markets in their index are uh, Kraken, um, Bitstamp, and uh, uh, GDAX, right? Yep. Yeah, and, um, and Bitstamp being the thinnest of the three, uh, it looks like what happened on May 17 is somebody came into that market, moved that market down with a, a very outsized... Um, uh, sell order below the, uh, the 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 market price, and as a result, I think uh, you know tripped off some of the kind of momentum ignition type of uh, activity that we were just talking about. Do you think that's a common event? Like, is that kind of thing happening frequently, where you have somebody who's got a position in uh, in the derivatives markets manipulating the spot markets in order to profit? I don't know if it's common, just because it does require such a large commitment of capital um mm -hmm. that there's probably yeah there's probably like a few select scenarios where it's even possible right right and then, then you still have to do the calculus of like how likely am i to actually uh you know, come it's, out. Like, it's a big heist yeah like you're definitely popping some champagne corks after <laughs> after successfully uh stealing all i mean uh making that trade <laughs> um but the one thing that uh that i think the the after effect of that is that you know you know we still haven't seen any of these you know ETFs even look like they're close to, yeah. you know, to getting the, the nod from the SEC. But I think it's events like this May 17 event that makes them so uncomfortable that, you know, somebody could, you know, market sell a significant amount of, uh, of Bitcoin that causes these cascades for their own personal gain. 
that's what you know makes them very uncomfortable with the, the fact that there may be market manipulation, but it's very hard to uh, to prove or to pinpoint yeah. you know who or what's going on if it's in coordination or collusion or if it's just one you know one person. What um talk a little bit about kind of the assurances you get from trading on something like CME. Uh, you know, like why, if I can do that on, on Bitstamp and make BitMEX move in that way, why can't I do that on one of the constituent spot exchanges that CME uses and do the same thing in the CME market? It's just more capital intensive, like, like Tim was mentioning. I think that there's also more, you know, when you have more regulation, you're going through, you know, FCMs, you have more, mm -hmm. pe more, more people that are looking at, you know, that trading activity. Um, you know, it's also why, you see more of the traditional hedge funds and folks that are in the space, they are trading in many cases, not on the spot markets because they can't get their compliance teams comfortable with, you know, the custody or the, mm -hmm, right. the counterparties in there. Um, and, you know, they can trade, you know, CME futures, you know, through their prime broker that they already have a relationship with right. um, through their FCM. Are you also talking about like a huge difference in terms of leverage, right? So you're talking right. about 100x leverage on some of these offshore platforms versus, yeah. you know, call it like two or three times leverage effectively on CME. Right? It's, I mean, how attractive is that? Like to, to what, I mean, is, is I sort of look at 100x leverage and, and kind of like gambling addiction, the words gambling addiction kind of flash. I feel like a, a PSA is about to roll. Like, you know, you know you, that I need to slow down, you know, <laughs> like what? What I mean, to what kind of a trader is 100x, or what kind of investor, I should say, is 100x leverage attractive? Is it is it strictly for the degenerate gambler, or um, is there actually a legitimate use uh, for that amount of leverage in a derivatives market? I mean, there is a 100x leverage in a lot of derivatives markets, to be fair, right? Yeah. I think it's just you usually don't combine that with something that has like an a 80 or 90 annualized volatility. Um, that That's where it tends to yeah. cause issues. That might cause problems, yeah. Yeah, um, it's like, um, you know, people compare it to like, say, orange juice, right? Orange juice futures, like, well, orange juice and gasoline, that's how you make napalm, right? That's just like, the, <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's not the, it's not just like orange juice futures, because it's, because it's, uh, it's this incredibly volatile underlying. Um, so, so t let's, let's walk through the derivatives markets a little bit. And we talked a lot about the offshore exchanges, which, you know, uh, um, what, what kind of products are available on those markets? And, and you know, in general, uh, do, the, do the products in crypto derivatives pretty much map to what you can get in traditional markets in derivatives? Or what's the mix of different uh, derivatives assets that you can invest into and out of? Yeah, um, so the most popular ones in our space are known as perpetual swaps. So it's basically, it looks like a linear instrument on Bitcoin or Ethereum or another coin. Um, and there's no settlement date on it. So that's uh -huh. how it differs from future. Uh -huh. um, and then, uh, yeah, like that's pretty much offered or nearly everywhere you can get a ton of leverage on it. And those it. were like invented by BitMEX, is that right? I don't know if it was necessarily like invented, BK. but it was certainly popularized popularized in our space by them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and it's and it's certainly something that is a kind of a new a novel uh, instrument in crypto. It's not something you you would have seen in traditional markets. Um I mean I think like this. maybe the best uh maybe the best analog would be for sort of like these retail spread betting uh sites. Sure, right? yeah. Um, uh -huh. You know, they offer CFDs that have like a similar similar amount of leverage, but for less volatile yeah. uh, underlying. Well, I, I mean, because you can get a CFD in Bitcoin uh, from uh, eToro, right? And um, I was talking to an investor in London who was saying it's advertised all over the two. I, uh, I believe <laughs> it. Yeah, I believe <laughs> it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, so perpetuals, futures? Futures to a less, lesser extent. And I think like... CME definitely still leads in some regards on that front. Uh huh. And then what about options? Um, options is pretty light, I would say, at the moment. Um, so uh, on on these offshore platforms, you have Deribit, uh, which is probably mm -hmm. sort of market leader in that regard. Certainly, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and, and then you have some you have some OTC shops that will do uh, that will do you know price out some options. Um, we don't at the moment. It's something that we've you know, looked at adding to the offering right. in the future, but right now we haven't seen too, too much demand. Uh -huh. And then you also have uh, LedgerX here right. in, uh, in the U.S. Right. Um, LedgerX and Deribit are like the two standard offerings and options right now. That's right. Yeah. 
So we've got a couple more coming on, uh, I think, right? Uh, CME is going to offer yep. options on their futures contracts, and so apparently is backed. And as you mentioned, uh, Martin, I think uh, B2C2 I know has like a, a over-the-counter product in um, either contracts or difference or options or, or you know, derivatives in that. And, yeah, right. And um, who else? Oh, Acuna. Acuna does as well, I think. But so, so what, I mean, given that the volume so far has been fairly small, what do you expect to see? I'm curious, actually, Martin, from your perspective, from a more onshore kind of regulated perspective, what does uh, the advent of a CME options product mean uh, for you guys and for your clients? I think it means that there are more sophisticated hedging strategies. Um, you know, I think it allows people to potentially get more comfortable with, with spot exposure if it can be properly, you know, hedged out or more, more easily hedged out, I mm -hmm. should say. Um, you know, these markets move really, really quickly. And, and a lot of the bigger, you know, places that, that want to start trading, there's a significant amount of headline risk attached to this. So mm -hmm. how do they protect against, you know, the, the crazy downside move? You know, options may very well, you know, help eliminate some of those risks for them. Yeah. And not in a, and I mean, if you could just talk a little bit, like why options, not futures. What 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 are the advantages that an op that a you know an option on a Bitcoin future would provide over just uh, you know uh, hedging on the futures contract itself? Yeah, I think it's just a little bit more you know a little bit more bespoke. Um, you know, you'll have more you know more levers to pull and and more you know potentially one more you know one more avenue for liquidity. I mean, I'd be curious to see what what Yen thinks. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really about being a little more sophisticated, right? So in terms of, let's say, I just want to protect against the Armageddon downside scenario, uh -huh. right? Like that's a that's an incredibly expensive thing to do uh, without really um, engaging in, in some sort of options trade. Um, so along those lines, I think we had one person writing in in advance of the webinar with a question mm -hmm. about, um, the uh, the upcoming um, uh, happening of the Bitcoin reward and kind of hedging uh, or, or you know making a bet maybe a speculative bet uh, or hedging against that. Uh, curious if you think like sort of an op you know if options come through as planned I think by um, uh, at least one shop is planning this quarter and if, if sort of a growth in options happens. Um, do you think there'll be more sophisticated strategies for approaching or how would you approach an event like that in terms of trying to uh, hedge against it or bet on it uh, using derivatives markets? Um, I guess uh, I'll be honest. I, I think of it as like a bit of a non-event. Um, huh. That's just my personal take. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> but, but to the extent that other people are going to treat it as an event, right? It's just, yeah. it's just like, it seems like it's an opportunity to sell ball. Right? So okay. that, that's, that, that's how I would, that, that's how I think but about it. In our it. space, what's, what I thought was pretty you know, interesting, funny, I don't know what you would say, but, you know, you now have places, you know, in this world where we now have, you know, the the fantasy sports and being able to, to bet on different outcomes there, you know, now you're starting to see some of the same, you know, type of stuff where for mm. the for the happening, you can now, you know, bet on the time, you know, what day do you think that the happening is going yeah. to occur? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're still going to see some of these different, like, retail -y focused, you know, you know, bells and whistles that, 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 uh, you know, people will, will add. That's just kind of right. a, a product of the time, but we are right now, but it just goes to show you how, how, you know, traditional, you know, retail is really doing some fairly sophisticated, you know, trading, not mm -hmm. to say that they're, you know, the, to the success, you know, obviously it's still retail trading. There's a reason why, you know, the biggest, you know, guys in the, in, in the world want to get that retail type flow, but they're still doing, you know, trading with leverage, tr you know, trading options, trading mm -hmm. futures. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting to see, you know, everyday investors taking advantage of the, you know, of the more sophisticated products that maybe they didn't have access to in other markets. Yeah. I mean, I sort of think of Bitcoin as like a, um, itself as a kind of a venture capital bet that anybody can access. Uh, if you just, I mean, that's just a buy and hold type of viewpoint on mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so I guess, you know, Building on that, you think about, okay, well, what are the other types of instruments and strategies that now uh, a retail investor can access that otherwise might be less less accessible uh, in crypto? Uh, but I wonder, like, how does it break down? I mean, again, like on that question, how does it break down between institutional and retail? Obviously, a retail-led phenomenon from the beginning, 
do you feel like there's a, a kind of a tipping point where institutions start to have their thumb on the scale a little more, or are we still in a market that's driven by, say, retail enthusiasm for a narrative like the happening or something? I think we're still seeing, you know, d definitely seeing a lot more institutions, you know, with their thumb or finger on the button, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, you know, we're Not starting thumb on the scale. <laughs> yeah, but finger on the button. Finger on the button. Finger on the button. Uh, so, uh, thumb on the scale. Either way. Uh, so. Uh, but, but I mean that's, that's that moves. I mean it's more. That's a, a entirely different order of magnitude of money yeah. coming in. But if you look right? at the, and that's exactly correct. It's a, it's a different magnitude of money coming in. You know the positions have to be right sized to start. But you're seeing, you know, pensions, endowments. You know you're seeing the public stuff like where you see you know Harvard endowment investing into mm -hmm. crypto funds. You know I can tell you that there's other you know pensions and endowments that are actually accessing, you know, whether it's, you know, Grayscale's products, whether it's, you know, direct investing through different places. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we're seeing that, you know, that we hadn't seen maybe in, in years past, but it's still not the crazy, uh, you know, like in 2017, everybody, you know, kept saying, you know, just like, wait till the institutions right. come, you know, the institutions yeah. are coming. This is all right. retail. We haven't seen necessarily that flood of sophisticated yeah. institutions. Um, but they are all very keen on what's being built here. They're, they're watching it very closely, but I think that the market still has a, a bit of a ways to go before you know, we'll start to see a huge transition into the landscape of institutions you know, kind of outsizing the, the retail. Yeah, in terms of who's still giving up edge to, kind of, uh, to, to mm -hmm. access liquidity in our space, I still think it's much more retail. Um, and I think that there has been sort of a, uh, a uh, cohort of more traditional trading shops who have made the leap into our space in order to mm -hmm. take advantage of that, um, right? If people are going to pay for liquidity, you want to be there to provide it, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think like that's probably been the biggest market change in, in, in my opinion of like the last 18 to 24 months is yeah. a lot of those folks saying, you know what, like there's enough edge in the space and we've gotten comfortable enough with it from a regulatory standpoint that we're willing to do this. Um, I want to I want to go a little bit deeper into that and that sort of narrative that the institutions are are coming in this story about pent up demand, which I think everybody at this point has got to recognize is bogus. Uh, but first, I want to give a little shout out because I did we did get word that uh, someone from Bitmex was listening and uh, wanted to clarify that they did invent the uh, perpetual swap. Uh, so <laughs> uh, one county heard from in the peanut gallery there. Uh, the the um, so. Uh, on the question of, I mean, that narrative kind of reached its height in 2017, right? When in December, everybody was like, man, you know, uh, futures are coming, CME is going to do this, the institutions are, this is going to unlock the pent up institutional demand. And um, it seems like the exact opposite happened. And I, I'm curious whether, you know, what you think sort of happened there. I, I sort of like the narrative that CME options launched, nobody, excuse me, CME futures launched and CBOE as well. Uh, within weeks of each other in December 2017, nobody was buying them. Uh, you know, it was very small volume. Although, not you know, not disrespect, not like a you know, not a sort of a not a bad launch necessarily as a new uh, derivatives product, What's but certainly like didn't. Launch? Was that? Yeah, like, like back just launch. like the back launch. And back is now you know growing. I mean, it's I don't think like the derivatives markets are really known for for innovation, at least not in the U.S. Uh, we're talking about like, pork bellies and. Well, you and your big fan of pork belly. Yeah, yeah, me too. I love them. Yeah, me too. Definitely. But uh, it's not a, a market that innovates quickly. It's not nimble. Most of the volume comes from like, you know, two, three, four handful of different products, right, uh, that have been traded the same way for decades. Uh, so, you know, I think maybe people's expectations were a little inflated. And when that didn't happen, it took the air out. But a lot of people also say, no, you know, being able to short uh, was what took the air out of the market. Now people had a short instrument and a way to get in that way. Uh, and that was what kind of punctured the bubble in 2017. So I'm curious what you guys think about that. And I also then want to look ahead to, you know, new options products coming on, uh, growth in futures and other derivatives. Are we looking forward to another puncturing? Yeah. I mean, it was a, you know, 2017 is really kind of the, the perfect storm. I mean, you had all these different, you know, ICO projects raising billions of do dollars mm -hmm. on, you know, a white paper and in, in most cases, untested or unknown teams. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think it was something possibly non-existent. To right. Also, so there was right something now. that was just so you know so very frothy that it, the the bubble had to burst at at some point. Um, you know, I think that you know Bitcoin with the store of value, you know, uh, you know potential there. Mm. You know, I think that's why we started to see you know Bitcoin's dominance in the years to come after that. Um, but you know, was it the you know, was it the futures or was it just, you know, generally the market, you know, it was crazy. Um, and I mean, I, I sure, I'm sure that you felt this, you know, with you, but I mean, volumes on the OTC side, I mean, it was in 2017, it was so many new, you know, new, new individuals, mm-hmm. you know, high net worth, new funds, new, new folks coming in. It was a, a ton of new money mm-hmm. coming in just to get a, you know, just to get a part of the action. Right. Um, you know, that can't, possibly go on, you know, for forever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that people thought that the institutions would then, you know, pick up where mm-hmm. where the retail left off mm-hmm. and not realizing how much work it is. I mean, if you look at somebody like uh, like a Fidelity, mm-hmm. you know, their Fidelity Digital Assets team, you know, they have been looking at this space for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And they have buy-in from the very top level. They do. And just look at how long it took them to launch their product yeah, yeah. that they have now, right. it just and that's somebody who has buy-in from the very very right. senior most person there Indeed. that still took you know years and years to come to market. So if you think about you know what's required at, at a large yeah. institution, and this is still a small market for them. Right. Uh, so you know I do think that it's coming, but we still have a, a bit of a ways to go. Um, you know, at least in in my opinion. And yeah. do do you think that that more having more derivatives volume uh, is a is a kind of a um, will, will will sort of will be negative in terms of the price run up or or um, what's your feeling on that, Yin? Like, how does the, how do the derivatives kind of again on this mm-hmm. question of how they play with the spot? Do you feel like if uh, if institutional investors have more and, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the word options. More derivatives possibilities in front of them. W- will that will that be a negative? Uh, will that put sell pressure or, or buy pressure on the price? Um, I, I think you know one thing about the space is still that it's a fairly fixed pool of money, if you will, right? And so anything that really expands access in that regard is probably going to be a good thing in terms okay. of you know maybe it doesn't mean up, but it certainly means like more efficient price discovery as a whole, uh-huh. right? Like certainly like one of the reasons why these flash crashes happen is because there's simply no way to inject a lot uh, of capital into the right. system in a very short, uh, on short notice. Right. And my, my, my opinion is we're seeing a lot of these, you know, of these, you know, instruments and these derivatives, you know, pop up because who is, who are the institutions that are in the market right now? It's the, you know, largest, most sophisticated, you know, high frequency, you know, proprietary trading firms in the world. Mm-hmm. And what do those guys need? They understand these derivatives. They're going to get their edge anywhere that they can. Uh-huh. So it, it's almost fulfilling that need for you know for these sophisticated you know folks. Um, you know I do think that more liquidity is is more. Uh, but I do think that we need to see you know to to really be successful, we do need to see more spot volume. We do need to see more you know so you know I don't know if it's going to be consolidation amongst exchanges um, or or what. But I do think that we we need uh, you know a little bit more orderly markets mm-hmm. um, you know out there. So what's going to get us there? Yeah. You know, could it be institutions getting you know getting priced to a, a place where it is where it does become more stable because it now takes much more capital to move the market up and down? It, it could be, but we're still you know I still feel like we're early days. I still think that's why you know we're so excited about this market is because we have all these products and services coming on board and we're still early days but mm-hmm. there's still demand um, and we're still seeing you know new new entrants into the space every day. I want to start taking some of these questions coming in from people listening um, and kind of on the same thread that we're talking here. I wonder uh, how you guys feel about decentralized exchanges. Interesting or don't care? Uh, it's interesting as a technology. I think the hurdle with any exchange, not decentralized or centralized, is how do you aggregate liquidity, right? right. Like that's a that's a very old problem and it's not unique to yeah. a DEX. Um, but I think like that's the hurdle that I think a lot of folks um, maybe like 
spend more time developing as opposed to like the underlying technology of how you know how two people meet. Yeah, no shock here that we're you know we you know I think it's it's you know it's going to be the future. It's going to be what it looks like. But for now, I don't know how we get over um, if you're a sophisticated institution that requires places you do KYC AML. Mm -hmm. How do you trade trade on a decentralized exchange? It's just it's very difficult to impossible to to justify. Um, so I, I do think that it's really, really exciting, um, but I, I still think it's very, very early. Yeah. Um, <laughs> think about Craigslist. That's kind of where you are with decentralized exchanges right now. Yeah, I, I would say maybe, I mean, I, I thought what you were saying was pretty interesting because I think it actually could be applied to the entire crypto space as a whole, like kind of, you know, maybe a little less time on, on securing the underlying infrastructure. With, with some very important exceptions and a little more time on, you know, figuring out what's the actual use case that is going to bring people through the door because the liquidity hurdle, the liquidity moat is not um, insurmountable. I mean, if you look at what BitMEX did to um, absolutely right, they came in as a, as a kind of a challenger uh, in that space and, and quickly aggregated a ton of volume for right? a ton of liquidity. It's just been impressive what they've been able to do uh, yeah. in a short amount of time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And so you wonder, like, I mean, it's it's easy. It's it's kind of hard to imagine, you know, somebody, you know, in any in any industry, it's hard to imagine somebody disrupting Facebook or whatever. But uh, you sort of think about, well, what's the next? You know, this this market tends to move a little faster than others. What's the next sort of twist and turn, and who will be the? They the have they, they have a significant amount of competitors that are that are yeah. coming. I mean, you you look at yeah, you know, Deribit, FTX. Yeah. I mean, you have a bunch of uh, of folks. So you know, I think that that's you know, who benefits in the end? I mean, it's the end consumers that are using these products. It's why, you know, it's why, you know, OTC makes so much sense because right. everybody's competing for that same business. It keeps spreads down. It keeps, you know, it, it definitely, um, you know, helps. It helps with the innovation. I mean, they keep having to improve their products and their product. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if you think of like liquidity as a product, right? I mean, Martin and I were both fortunate enough to be involved in the market when demand way outstripped supply back yeah. in 2017, right? And yeah. over time, that supply is filled in. And naturally, you know, the, the the fee that you can charge for liquidity has gone down. Yeah, right. And you've seen a lot more competitors, as I mentioned, uh, Jane Street, et cetera, coming in. Um, I've, I've heard people say that the uh, the margins in uh, the OTC business are down by, by about half or more, something like that. Do you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah. I, say, I mean, from 2017, yeah. you know, early days, I would sure. say more. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so let's see, I want to get into some more of these questions coming in from listeners here. Um, okay. So slow finality of Bitcoin transactions, does that impact the way you guys do business? Uh, I mean, do, do you have, I mean, is there like, you know, one confirmation, 10 confirmations, a hundred confirmations, are you guys, are, are people in OTC, I guess I should say in general, traders on OTC desks, is that a limit? In, in 2017, I would say. Yes, because, you know, mempool would back up, things would get slow. Mm. And also we required, you know, more confirms than just because, you know, as, you know, as there are more, you know, more people in the space, as there are more nodes, as there are more miners, mm. you know, obviously now getting a confirm is pretty final, um, you know, even once you have one or two or three. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, when the mempool's backed up, can it be a nuisance? Certainly, but for, for us, um, you know, because we're acting second, um, you know, we're, we, we just, it may slow down the, the settlement, yeah. but think about all the great things that we have now in, you know, 24 seven settlement through our banking partners. You know, many people use the same banks, you know, if you set things up on the back end, then you can basically settle 24 seven. Uh -huh. Um, so while it may take, you know, it used to be, you know, fed wire cut off, you know, th there's going to be no more, you know, we'll, we'll send you the Bitcoin on Monday. Um, whereas now, you know, they're able to send funds and we're able to get, uh, yeah. get digital assets out the door right. you know, pretty quick. So our settlement times are, you know, impressively fast. Um, you know, I think given, you know, where traditional markets are with a T plus two or a T plus three. But 
Uh, but I mean, we're talking about 15 minutes. Right. You know, if somebody sends yeah, Bitcoin. But a lot can happen in Bitcoin in 15 minutes. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, so I, actually, a good introduction on uh, I, I mean, we're pretty much jumping right into the, you know, more sort of strategic stuff here. But I think if you're if you're interested in a, in a sort of a, a introduction to the OTC business, by the way, uh, Clay Collins at uh, Nomics did put together a very good one uh, with one of the founders of um, Galois Capital. Um, and uh, that that just walked through the kind of minute by minute. And and specifically, actually, like ten second by ten second, because one of the one of the things that uh, the the interviewee was saying on the podcast is that um, uh, typically an OTC desk will will quote a price, and that price is good for about ten seconds, thirty seconds. It depends on if the market's moving or not. Depends on right? the market's like we would moving, we would definitely the refresh. Uh, we would we would expect the client to refresh us after about ten seconds. <laughs> okay. But keep in mind that. You know, this yeah. is also a relationship business as well. And, right. you know, things haven't moved tremendously, you know, uh -huh. between the time that we quoted, then it's yeah. totally fine. You know, you you know who uh, who you have to refresh quickly and who you can give more time. <laughs> well, um, you know, so I'm I'm curious on um, about, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm as, I know that when you were at Circle, Ian, that you guys had some clients there who were minors. Um, and I don't know to what extent you guys have. At, at Genesis have uh, clients in the mining industry, industrial miners, but I know that that's a big, uh, you know, user of OTC trade. Uh, and I'm curious what your insights into are into their mentality. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about how derivatives will be used by miners to hedge, like the miners are sort of the natural hedge of the derivatives product. Uh, and I'm curious whether you think that's, do you think that's an accurate reflection of the way miners approach the industry or, you know, kind of what's their mentality and how are they behaving, especially like in this market right now? Um, I honestly think that a lot of miners are more cost efficient crypto funds. It's effectively, all right, well, I'm really not all that interested in selling any Bitcoin or other coin that I'm mining right now. Um, but if I can get it for 5,000 bucks a pop instead of 9,000, mm -hmm. why wouldn't I? Right. Yeah, Even and they're, and they're all, you know, by and large, a lot of these guys are very bullish on the underlying assets that they're you know, that they're mining, which is why they're doing it in the first place. So they definitely lean towards trying to prepare for, you know, the, the crazy, you know, success as opposed to, you know, necessarily being too, too concerned. Like, yes, they want to make sure that they can keep the lights on, mm -hmm. but they're not, they're more concerned about, hey, this thing's going to, you know, these crazy prices. How do I take advantage of, of that when it comes as opposed to, you know, like there's, and there's now there's more sophisticated you know, miners that are in the space and they've gotten a lot better just as the market has grown. You know, many of these folks started out as, as hobbyists and, and then they have these huge firms or, or became huge firms or more and more sophisticated people got in. Uh -huh. um, so it's changed, uh, you know, it's changed a lot. I mean, we see on the borrowing and lending side, they're great clientele, you know, whether it's, they have, you know, product to lend or they right. need cash for working capital. Yeah. Um, you know, so we have some, some great relationships there. And, you know, obviously that's a, you know, when you're an OTC desk, um, you know, having a supply of, you know, of sellers that are at a regular interval right. is really, you know, a nice thing to have. I feel like the mining psychology has got to be fascinating. I mean, you're on the one hand, you're this person who, as you said, is like long, it's a crazy risky bet. It's not, I mean, it's not as easy the math as you were saying, because you're, you're saying, well, I'll buy it for 5,000, but the price could go down to 3,000. Right. But right. I think so to the extent that you, have, you sort of, you sort of locked yourself into the 5,000 once you set up the mining farm. Right? For sure. It's like that, right? Yeah. If we do have like an extreme downward move, right? Right. So on the one hand, you've got this like crazy long mentality. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, like minute mm -hmm. attention to detail, cost, conservation, right? Operations, focus. Right. I and mean, I feel like to be successful, you got to have some like pretty unique combination of those two things. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I think just descriptively, you know, if you only have so many hours in a day, I just descriptively, I think what we've seen is that if you're a miner, you spend way more time thinking about how do I make my operation more efficient necessarily right. than, all right, like what exactly does like my cash flow profile look right. like? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, uh, I want to maybe get one more in here, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, so I I'm sort of Martin, maybe from your perspective, uh, in terms of just not necessarily trading on, but watching the offshore derivatives exchanges. Like, let's say I'm an investor who's you know, there's no way I'm going to set foot on a Bitmex or a Huobi. Would w w is it worth watching? Why should I be paying attention 
or what's the reason why those are why those markets operations are relevant to me? Yeah, I mean, I think that because they could very easily, you know, move the the, the underlying markets. You know, they're going to move in tandem, um, and so I think you need to be watching, you know, all of these markets because when things start to go, you know, one way or, or another, um, you know, it's really difficult to 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 be able to predict where it may, you know, where it may start. You know, it could be the you know, the fat finger on, you know, Bitstamp, uh -huh. it could be, you know, somebody on a derivatives exchange. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just really tough to, to, to be able to tell. So, you know, I think that it's what makes this space so, so fun, but so difficult is just knowing the Bitcoin market is, is a huge undertaking in itself. Yeah. And then adding in all of these, you know, adding in some other tokens that you need to, need, need to, to, to watch or follow. It's just a huge amount of data that you've got to consume. Yeah, um, and you got to stay up all night. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> and there's no stopping. So, so um, I mean, you know, on that point, like, I mean, you saw Poloniex, right? Basically, basically moving offshore. I, I read that as you know, some people read that as kind of a capitulation on the business. I didn't see it that way at all. I saw it as a circle, you know, moving their exchange that they've invested in offshore to have a more favorable regulatory environment. Um, Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think there's a, a, an important question to be asked. Can can a U.S. regulated exchange in derivatives or spot keep up with what's happening, uh, you know, offshore and in Asia? Uh, are those practices of those, you know, are the are the sort of the, the market structure of a BitMEX, is that sustainable? Should, you, you know, U.S. regulators and U.S. based exchange operators be trying to emulate or should, you know, just sort of ride this out, move slowly, and, and eventually uh, things will normalize? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely an extent of, well, yes, I, I ultimately, yes. Like, there, there's a good reason for U.S. exchanges to try to compete here because ultimately it matters, like, where are your inflows coming from, right? right? If you're simply tapping into a different capital base than, than the offshore exchanges are, absolutely, there's, you know, there, there, there's a business to be had. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be tough to keep up. I mean, these, right. uh, these you know, uh, there is a ton of development going on, you know, in, you know, offshore, you know, generally Asia, you know, like there's a ton happening there. And I think that, you know, it's definitely going to be, you know, it's going to be difficult to, to keep up, um, you know, as the market continues to, uh -huh. to grow, if we don't see, you know, at least a little bit more clarity on the regulatory yeah. side, you know, I'm still a little bit of, you know, of the opinion that, you know, we need, you know, Bitcoin is maybe a little bit different of an animal in that, mm -hmm. you know, you've got, you've got something that maybe it's, it's tough, to, it's easier to keep that market share, but there's all of these other assets that are out there that are trading in meaningful size or becoming and becoming more meaningful that is happening, right. you know, away. Right. And that's where you see the, the spot, at least in the spot market. The huge growth in the offshore exchanges. That's exactly just, right. Supplanted the uh, the bit uh, the bit That's exactly right. So I think yeah, on the, the, on the Bitcoin, yeah. Ethereum side, yeah. you know, can you know, kind of the more heavily regulated places yeah. keep you know keep you know relevance and, yeah. and you know and and improve. Yeah. yeah. So so Bitcoin maximalists move to the U.S. <laughs> great here. It's great. Um, Okay, well, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming on. Can you just take, and, oh, and I also want to say, by the way, that this uh, podcast, is, excuse me, this webinar is recorded and will be emailed out to all the guests and participants uh, who listened in. So thank you to all of you for coming in. And if you guys could just say a little bit about where people can find you. Um, I, I know we did get a question from somebody who was trying to search reciprocity trading. Do you guys even exist? We are <laughs> definitely under wraps right now. What's, what's the sort of web address or URL or whatever where people can get in touch with you the best way? Um, well, luckily, there's only one Yun Feng Xiao generally on the web. So if you just look up my name, you can find <laughs> okay. me. There you go. Uh, Martin, how about uh, Genesis? Yeah, so our website, GenesisTrading.com, you know, you'll be able to, uh, to find me, uh, you know, if it's, uh, if it's LinkedIn, Twitter, any of those things uh, are easy ways to get hold of me.